Uh, we are in this series that's called End of Me. It's, it's based on a book by Kyle Eidelman, and really what he's showing us is that there's some core statements that Jesus makes in his Sermon on the Mount, in his Beatitudes. His contention is that he's offering us a new way of life, a, a way that's definitely countercultural. And we know this about Jesus. If, you, if you've been in church any time, you know that Jesus thinks differently than, than, than the leaders of the world will ever think. And so he leads us differently because he thinks differently because he wants different things for us. And he's showing us the blessings come from things that we might not think about. So for instance, he says that the world is going to teach us about aggressive self-centeredness. That's how we get ahead. But Jesus says, no, to find real life, you need to humble yourself. You need to admit that you're spiritually destitute apart from God. And that's where real life begins. And then he also tells us that, you know, honestly, there are things in your life that will destroy you. So one of the things that, that he says is that if you want to find happiness, you have to actually mourn. You have to start with grieving with God about the things in life that, that hurt us, that God agrees with, with us on that. The world wants you to believe that... <clears throat> When you get what you want in life, it's going to come through ego, through grit, through determination. And, and though there are things in life that come that way, he says, real happiness comes from an attitude of meekness. Now, that doesn't mean weakness. Jesus was not weak, and he doesn't want us to be weak. But we admit that our sin puts barriers between us and God and creates disharmony in our life. That's what it means to to reach out to God for help out of meekness. Many of us think that we'll ascend to godliness if we appear to have it all together, and so we wear masks. We try to pretend we're something we're not. Jesus says that if we rely on God, he'll take the mask off, and we'll find our true self, and we'll, and we'll live a life of joy and peace. And now in another beatitude, another statement from the happiest man, the most fulfilled man ever to walk on the planet, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. The message paraphrase says it this way, you're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God, he's food and drink in the best meal you'll ever eat. Now, that, by the way, he's talking my language now. I'm a foodie, okay? So I can relate to, to this, this, this urge, desire for, you know, this craving for food. For, in me, anybody else, kind of strong. I mean, I, I have to say. Uh, you're probably not going to be surprised to know that the Super Bowl Sunday is the second largest food and beverage event in America. Are you surprised by that? So, for instance, Americans will consume... Nine million pounds of tortilla chips. Wow. 12 million pounds of potato chips. 13 million pounds of guac. And by the way, the sale of antacids will go up 20%. Mainly from Packers fans. <laughs> Couldn't resist. Nick Shalom. So most of us understand craving, but to be honest, have you ever been so famished, so parched that your life was at stake? I mean, I mean, not just, man, I'm so famished, I haven't eaten in three hours, or, you know, or what a workout, I better get something to dehydrate myself. I'm not talking about that. I mean, literally starving to death, that desperate. If you have, most of us haven't. I, I have to admit, I've never been that far gone. But if you have, you know what it's like to physically come to the end of me. And this is Jesus' metaphor for the person who is in desperation if they remain unfulfilled by God himself. And what he's showing us is a need. And that need is that I have this crave, this crave for my empty to be filled. And here's the thing. Most of us don't feel that empty. 
And the reason that we're not feeling empty is because we mask our hunger with the wrong kind of things. We, we fill our lives, so to speak, with spiritual junk food. And it works until, until you get sick. Have you seen that documentary by Morgan Spurlock called Supersize Me? It's kind of an old one. It's really crazy. What he does is for, he, for one whole month, for 30 days, he eats nothing but junk food. Now, he's a healthy guy. He, you know, he, he watches his diet. He's very close. He's, he's a man who exercises and does all kinds of things you should do. So for 30 days, he, he ate nothing but, but junk. He went to fast food restaurants three times a day for 30 days, and he packed on 25 pounds in a month, which to me is no big deal. I could do that. But he basically fell apart, and he started getting tired and he got headaches, and his blood sugar, of course, skyrockets. Cholesterol, of course, went off the chart. And the doctors say, man, you've got to stop. You've got to stop. He's going to kill you. He said, I felt terrible. I would eat, and I would feel so good because I get sugar and caffeine and that fat. Then an hour later, I, I would just crash. I'd hit the wall and be angry and depressed. I was a disaster to live with, he said. See, to, to you and I, hunger means waiting for the rolls to come out. <laughs> That's about as hungry as we get. Or, or hungry for us is, this guy's been talking for 24 minutes, and i got to get to the restaurant. That's, for us, that's hunger. But for most of us, that sensation, it's not what we're talking about with Jesus here in this, in this passage. For the people who were there on that mountainside when Jesus was speaking, they, most of them, understood what real hunger and thirst was. Very few of them were prosperous. Most were probably dirt poor. Many of them probably hadn't eaten that day. And they could have been very hungry at that moment. Most of them understood what chronic thirst and hunger felt like because they lived in a place where they didn't have running tap water and, you know, a fast food restaurant around the corner and, you know, a convenience store to go grab some munchy stuff to get by. They didn't have any of that stuff. And so they understood what it was like to go days and upon days without food. There's definitely a spiritual parallel that Jesus is making. And you have to start by asking this question if you want to be intellectually honest with Jesus on this. What have you been eating? What have you been consuming? Because there's a lot of junk we binge on and and it fills us up for sure, but then we look in the mirror and we, the way, the way we feel, and it just isn't doing it for us. It makes us depressed and disillusioned. And it's because we're feeding our appetite with things that truly are not meant to really make us healthy and satisfy us. And I would submit that, that we are the most well-fed people on the planet when it comes to spiritual things. Not just food, not just the foodie stuff I'm talking about. As a matter of fact... I mean, I have numerous Bible apps on my phone. I've got a shelf full of spiritual books about Jesus and Christianity and the church and whatever else you can think of, and maybe you do too. I mean, I, I listen to, I don't know how many different podcasts of my favorite preachers and teachers in the scriptures. And like you, I go to a church that teaches from the word of God and, and we worship and we sing and we praise God. And so we have a lot of, lot of stuff hitting us in the spiritual realm. But we love our junk food, don't we? And I'm talking about what Jesus is talking about, a spiritual diet that will kill us. The prophet Isaiah said about 500 years before Jesus, this is Isaiah 55, why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy. Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. So Jesus wasn't the first one in the world to talk about spiritual appetites and eating the right things spiritually and drinking from the right cisterns. As a matter of fact, the, 
prophet Jeremiah put it this way about, about, about fluids and intake only. He's talking about spiritual things. The Holy One is not pleased when he observes people looking to other sources for refreshment. Be appalled at this, O heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns. Broken cisterns that cannot hold water. He's just saying people have been inventing their own religion, and they're following that. And in America, we're the kings of it. We do it more than anyone else. God wonders why we fill our lives with the things that were never meant to make us whole. For instance, what material things do I gorge myself on hoping that I'm just going to have a full life? What do I salivate over? Do I salivate over sports more than I should? I feel empty when my team is broken again and they lose. It's happened a lot. Are you spending your labor and your money on bread that will leave you empty in the end? Are you digging some cisterns that can't hold the water of your soul? <laughs> and if so, Jesus is saying, if you're hungry, I've got what you need. If you're thirsty, come to me. Crave righteousness, he says. He says, I'm going to be blessed if I hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, like we've been doing in this series, we have to break down these core words or else we're going to get lost. We have to understand what this word righteousness means. And let me just as simply as I can at least do it, let me try to explain it. Righteousness describes a way of life. It's a, it's a rhythm of life where God is at the center. He's at the center. And so these metaphors of eating and drinking... This is a comparison of what motivates us to live that kind of life. This, this word righteousness actually occurs five times in the Sermon on the Mount. And each time it brings added meaning to what Jesus wants to teach us about spiritual wellness and how, how to be whole. And so, for instance, he says, if I'm living in righteousness, it will in, at, at times invite opposition to my life. Persecution. He says this in Matthew 5.10. This is the last of these teachings. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. So if you take the fourth and the eighth beatitude, put them together, it might sound something like this. We are to hunger and to thirst after the kind of life that will probably make other people react poorly to us and even want to hurt us. That's how you know, because we are distinguish ourselves from a world, and that world will be hostile because of that. And it happens, and it's going to happen more and more, I think. Another thing about righteousness, it starts in the heart and changes the person from the inside out. Jesus says later, he says, for I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 5.20. So he's showing us that, that righteousness isn't about being religious because these religious people that he points out, I mean, in terms of the trappings of religion, they had it all down. These were people who were covering up their failings with their religious behavior. They're kind of like boys going through puberty who haven't yet figured out B.O., you know? Let me explain that. You boys who have been through this, you know what I'm talking about, okay? So... You're going to fight with your parents for a period of time about taking daily showers because your parents are going to notice he's starting to stink now. But you're a boy who doesn't want to take time to, to take showers, so you just start putting deodorant on. And they make you do that too because you weren't going to do that either. But you do that, but you know that eventually you can't mask that stink. It's coming out, okay? So you got to get clean. You got to get to the source and True righteousness starts in the heart and changes you from the inside out. Not from religion, not from that kind of activity. Here's another thing. Righteousness doesn't need to be seen by others, only by God. This is a big mistake that people make. We've all made it. He, he shows us in, in, uh, in uh, Matthew 6, 1, he says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of people. 
to be seen by them. That's the motive, to be seen. Otherwise, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So he's describing the faking it that we talked about last week. And these Pharisees, they, they were fakers. I mean, they loved to pray in public, and they did it loud and, and proud, and people were drawn to that. And they would go to the temple to give, and they'd take out their money, and they'd throw them in these metal containers and make as much noise as they could so that people could see how generous they were. I mean, they loved the praise of others. The way they dressed was to set them apart so that people would say, ooh, there's one of those religious guys. Ooh, cool. And you put these passages together, and what do you got? A truly Christ-first lifestyle changes us from the inside out. And when we get that, we are no longer doing this so that others might take note and they might then say, oh, well, there he is, and there she goes. It's a kind of life that is possible, but as a matter of fact, if, if we can get to that point of life, we're going to be blessed. We're going to be free. We're going to be whole. Being filled with righteousness is being filled with Christ. Being filled with him. I mean, do you have the kind of desperation in your life where you are willing to let him change you? from the inside out, because it's going to take that kind of desperation, that kind of hunger, that kind of thirst. And some of you, quite frankly, don't have it. And, and I wish I could make you have it. I can't, and he's not going to. You got to get there. Let me go on a limb and say this. Whatever you want in the spiritual realm, you can have it if you want it badly enough. As a matter of fact, we are as close to God as we want to be. We have about as much joy as we want to have. We have about as much peace in life as we're willing to invest in. For the most part, you are right where you need to be right now because that's where you put yourself and you want to be. And if you were hungry for something better, you would go after it. If you were thirsting for something deeper and richer, you would go find it. Jesus tells this amazing story about this great banquet in Luke 14. It's a parable. And in this story, the host sends out invitations far and wide. He's going to throw, to get, throw the biggest party ever, right? And it, like no other. And so he quickly, though, finds out that people have other things on their plate. I mean, like people aren't coming to the party. Some guy's engrossed in some big business deal, so he can't leave that. Another one's very busy with these personal responsibilities. A third person's actually got a pretty good excuse. They just got married. But, you know, they're back from Cancun now. I mean, you know, the, the, the fun's kind of worn off a little bit. Couldn't they just come to the party? They, you know, I'm just using some poetic license here. But all of them have excuses. And they all boil down to one. Ah, not that hungry for what you got. Not that thirsty for what you're offering. Maybe another time. Maybe down the road. And the simple matter of fact is this. None of them were hungry for what the host was offering them. They're after other stuff. Meaning and work. Romance. Possessions. All things that we try to fill our lives with. But God wants to fill us with something else. Jesus wants to fill us with himself. Jesus' appeal is always personal. He never says, you know, come and join the church. That's not his appeal. Come and give money to something. Come and be baptized. I mean, those things get said in some ways, but that's not the appeal of Jesus. Those are just things that happen because we follow him. He simply says, come to me. And when Jesus says, you come to me, he also says, I will fill you with me. Now, this is a hard concept for us to understand, but it's a true one. The French philosopher Pascal said that we have this God-shaped vacuum in our heart. And, and since nature abhors a vacuum, we will fill it with something. If we don't fill it with God, it will be filled with something else. And so many of us have filled our lives and our hearts with things that ultimately will not satisfy us and if not addressed, will kill us. I mean, it might be one religious experience from another. It might be 
you know, one relationship or another. Or it might be, you know, you know we, we jump careers because we think, well, I'm going to be happy if I start to do this because that didn't make me happy. And we do all these things that we try to fill our lives with. Jesus told his disciples that after he left him, left them, he said, I will fill you with something else, the Holy Spirit. That means that Jesus Christ will come into our life and go with us wherever we go. Sometimes he will counsel me and comfort me when I'm mourning. Sometimes he will give me a special gift to help someone. It's called mercy. And we're going to talk about that next week. Sometimes he'll help us just enough to overcome temptation. Just enough to move forward. He helps us. He, he gives us enough courage to do the living that we're meant to do. He'll do that for us. Let me give you some good news. In the kingdom of God, everything begins with the hungry, thirsty heart. Salvation begins with the hungry heart. And if you're tired of life and what it's dealing you, and if you feel like you're just, you know, bloated on junk food in life and you need to get a new start, he's your start. He's the one. Whatever you want in the spiritual realm, you can have it if you want it badly enough. He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. The question is, are you that hungry? Because don't live and die with a full stomach, but an empty heart. It's very likely that some of you hearing this message today are at the end of yourselves. You are at a place of real emptiness. And that wasn't a part of your life plan. You didn't get into what you're into you're thinking, oh, I'm going to let this ruin my life. Or I'm going to let this just keep me going down a rabbit trail of despair. You, you didn't do that. No, you didn't do that. Life has a way of pouring everything out of you. It has nothing to do with what you wanted Living in this world takes things from you. And that comes with the emotions of fear and desperation and heartache and loneliness and anger. And the ultimate devastation is that we're empty. But what if that emptiness is precisely where God needs you to be right now? What if that is the place where real life begins? What if the most hungry and thirsty moment is when the switch is flipped and the most desperate time we discover is the most wonderful tick on the clock where God goes to work and you encounter God and God steps into the void and he fills you with something that you never thought you could have? You can be right with God. You can be made right with the people around you. You can be made right with yourself. That's what righteousness is. Look, there's nothing wrong with a good job. There's nothing wrong with a good marriage. A good team to cheer for. A busy and healthy body. I'm in favor of all those things. I hope you are too. But God, even though he loves to meet our basic needs, and, may, and by the way, may you have all those things in abundance, but as good as they are, they're not as good as he is. Not in the depth of your soul. He will fill you, but you have to let him. You have to make room. You have to empty yourselves. Those of you who are in Rooted right now or have been through Rooted, you know this. If you're in it right now, you're experiencing this kind of emptying, so to speak, because you've been through a prayer experience or maybe you're right into that right now, I don't know. And you're asking God to empty out your soul so he can replace what's in there with the things that he knows needs to be there. And so you're going to struggle through something called strongholds. That might be right now. I don't know. It might be in your calendar. I don't know where it is. But you will plead with God to empty your life of, of pride, of selfishness, false ambition, bitterness, unforgiveness, everything that's contrary to his plan for your life. Before he can fill you, you need to empty you. But God fills those who come and say, you know, I can't do it. I'm at the end. I can't keep living this way. 
I, I, I would be a fool to starve to death when I have this banquet set out before me that he's offering me. When you get to that point, oh, now you're, now you're somewhere. You're where you need to be. Jesus told the people who would eventually crucify him, he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll have no part of me. And Jesus was not a leader of a cannibal cult. He was a master storyteller, as we've already seen. He's a master at using the things of everyday life to explain things that matter the most. When we commune here, that's what we're doing. We're taking this word picture and this story, this physical picture of the bread and the cup, and it's representing something very spiritually important to all of us. That Jesus offers himself to us. And he did it in the most dramatic way possible. He was crucified on a cross. He was buried in a grave, and he rose from the dead. And so he told his disciples right before that happened, take and eat, this is for you. And he passed that bread around and they ate some of it. And then he took a cup and he offered it to them. He said, this is symbolic of a promise that God's making you, a new one. The promise is, he's yours and you're his. It's a covenant, a covenant where God will free you from yourself and from sin and give you something better. Someday in the future, we will share this meal with him. I, don't, I can't even describe that, what that's going to be like, because I don't know. But for now, we share in spirit with him, because he has offered us this magnificent banquet. And the question is, are we going to be too busy to come? Are we going to be too preoccupied? Or are we just going to come and say, God, I need you, because I can't do it myself? Lord, we commune now. Some of us are ready for this moment. Some aren't. If we're not ready, Lord, we'll wait. If we are ready, we'll take that bread. We'll take that cup. And we'll remember again how much you love us, what you do to the extent of your love to save us, and why we can celebrate a new life with you. It's because of Jesus, because of you. Amen. You know this. And I'm talking about the spiritual things that we're talking about in church, not the foodie things that we like to talk about outside of the church or even at church, I don't know. But you know that, you know, when you're hungry or thirsty, you eat and you're filled and that feels real good for about five hours. And then you got to eat again. You got to drink again. You got to... Your body, your substance requires that. This is a spiritual conversation we're having. If, if you're a Christ follower and your diet has slipped, so to speak, look, just get back on track again. It's, it's the new year. We make all these resolutions and one of them we usually make is about what we're eating and how we're exercising and all that. Well, just get back on track. Come on, you're still, you're still breathing. Don't quit, don't give up, just get back into it. Appeal to the spirit. Stop gorging yourself on the deadly stuff. Do what hungry people do. Go back and start eating the right stuff, drinking the right things. Start opening your Bible. Get back to church, get to the small group that you've been putting off. Take the lead with your family, take a course correction, start leading them differently. I mean. For you, some of you, it's like, I, don't, I didn't know about this. I didn't realize that all this emptiness I'm feeling is a spiritual thing. I thought it was about the things I was doing in life or not getting done or my failures. It's really not. It's about what you're filling yourself with. And what Jesus says is, if you come to him, he'll, he'll fill you and he'll make it different for you. So come, do it. Don't be afraid. Let him reach into your life and change it. Let us be a church that helps you do that.